Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, Vice Chancellor, the University of the West Indies, the UWI. Professor Dale Weber, Pro Vice Chancellor and Principal, Monarch Campus, the UWI. Professor Rosemary and Bell Antoine, Pro Vice Chancellor, Graduate Studies and Research, the UWI. Dr. Stacy Richards Kennedy, Pro Vice Chancellor, Global Affairs, the UWI. Professor Winston Moore, Deputy Principal, Cave Hill, the UWI. Dr. Carla Barnett, Secretary General, CARICOM and Keynote Speaker. Members of the Diplomatic Corps. Professor Don Marshall, Director, Salises Cave Hill. Dr. Godfrey St. Bernard, Acting Director, Salises St. Augustine. Ladies and gentlemen online via UWI TV and CARICOM platforms, good evening. Welcome to the 2022 Sir Arthur Lewis Distinguished Lecture. A very special welcome to the staff and students at the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College in St. Lucia. I am Aldry Henry Lee, University Director, Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies, the UWI, and it is my pleasure to guide the proceedings this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, this annual distinguished lecture hosted by the Vice Chancellor, Sir Hilary Beckles, recognizes Sir Arthur Lewis's legacy and contribution to Caribbean development. This year's lecture is being delivered at a time when our Caribbean region is facing severe economic and social challenges intensified by the current pandemic and the Russian-Ukrainian war. How are we to overcome these challenges? Does Sir Arthur Lewis's work offer any insights? Our keynote speaker, Dr. Carla Barnett, will advise us. Her lecture is entitled, Sustained Economic Recovery Post-Pandemic, The Lewis Model. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very pleased that you can join us this evening. To the non-UE members of the audience, especially potential students, just a PR moment. The University of the West Indies is the number one university in the Caribbean and is ranked in the top 1.5% in the world. The Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies, Salises, is the number one social science research institute in the Caribbean. Salises' 23rd annual conference will be held online next week, May 3rd and 4th, 2022. The theme of the conference is Caribbean Lives, Disruptions, Resilience, and the Way Forward. For more information, please visit www.salisesregional.com. Today we are in for a very engaging evening with one of our distinguished UWI alumni, Dr. Carla Barnett, the first female Secretary General of CARICOM. We will begin this evening's proceedings with the official welcome by our host, Vice Chancellor Professor Hilary Beckles. What a tremendous joy and honor it is to participate in this 2022 Arthur Lewis Distinguished Lecture and to do so in hosting our distinguished Secretary General of CARICOM, Dr. Carla Barnett. This is not only an intellectual and pedagogical convergence it is also a crossroads in the development of thinking about the Caribbean economy at this moment. Sir Arthur Lewis, of course, we know to be the, the father of development economics in our region and in the world, indeed. And now we are in a circumstance looking to post-COVID economic development within the framework of regional integration, which is coordinated and led by our distinguished speaker today, Dr. Carla Barnett, not wearing the hat directly of well-known and distinguished economic practitioner, but as the leader of an integrated Caribbean strategy for achieving and sustaining economic development. We're very proud indeed, of the role that Salises has played over the years in fostering conversations in respect to economic strategy, relationships, and the potential for transformation. 
And I wish to thank its distinguished leader, Professor Audrey Henry Lee, for her outstanding leadership of this institute and for hosting Dr. Barnett at this moment. Of course, we are all very aware that our region had not fully recovered from the 2007-2008 global economic crisis when we were struck by the devastation of this COVID-19 pandemic. The two of them have co-joined over a period of 10 years to undermine the potential of this region as it was emerging uh, uh, sustainably in the last five to six years. But now we have to reflect upon the concept of economic recovery within the context of the need for new economic sectors and drivers, within the need to build resilience into the old sectors that have performed and performed so very well, like tourism, and the need for innovative strategies within this digital economic context. All of this is suggesting that this is an era in which the knowledge economy has to move to the forefront of our contemplations about the Caribbean. This is the digital moment. And critically, this is a special moment in which the university sector, as driver of the knowledge economy, must stand up, put up its hand, and say this is the moment in which university activity research, teaching, learning, the preparation of the next generation. This is the moment for the university to rise and shine. And we know this to be true because we believe, having looked at the Caribbean economy in the last 20 to 30 years, that it is more of a shortage of critical skills than a shortage of capital that is holding back economic transformation. We also know that the global is now the local we cannot imagine new sectors or, or transform all sectors without placing them fully in a competitive global context. The university has made its own contribution to this conversation. This is why we moved so aggressively in the last five years to globalize our university, to launch a reputation revolution to give to the people of the Caribbean a globally ranked and respected university. Here we are now, ranked in the top 1.5% of the best 30,000 universities in the world. Required a tremendous amount of hard work and strategic action, but this is where we are, UWI Global. Looking at the relevant of the Lewis model. After six decades of its evolution, its critical interpretations and reinterpretations, and we are so looking forward to hearing this presentation from our distinguished speaker, uh, Dr. Burnett. Furthermore, we are hoping that there will be wide participation in this conversation because it is arguably the most important moment facing us in the Caribbean. The rebuilding of our economies, the sustainability of the growth that we are in pursuit of. Because it is only upon this platform, it is only within this context that our institutions and our people and our community will be able to thrive in the years ahead. So the wisdom from our speaker today will indeed represent the pedagogical framework on which our strategies will evolve. So thank you, Professor Henry Lee, for inviting me to make Andy's opening remarks here in the Vice Chancellor's Forum, and to thank our distinguished speaker for taking the time to join within the university community and the wider Caribbean and sharing her extensive knowledge and her critical insights wish for everyone an enjoyable engagement. Many thanks, Vice Chancellor, for your warm welcome and your insightful context and your hosting of this distinguished lecture. 
Ladies and gentlemen, as many of you may know, Sir Arthur Lewis was born in St. Lucia on January 23rd, 1915. It is my pleasure to invite the students of the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College, St. Lucia, to make a presentation on Sir Arthur Lewis's life and work. Good evening. You see the black and white image to the right hand corner of your screen. And you may be wondering, who is this man? He is the famous economist, Sir Arthur Lewis. He came up with the theory of industrialization in the Caribbean. I, Estelle Albasi, along with Kiana Justin and Jelani Justin, will be presenting on industrialization of the British West Indies. Sir Arthur Lewis was a husband married to Gladys Jacobs Lewis from 1947 to 1991, a father to Barbara and Elizabeth Lewis, and the father who developed economics, a friend to many, St. Lucian, born on January 23, 1915, in Castries, St. Lucia, economist by profession, Nobel laureate awarded the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Science in 1979. Economic development. He created the dual sector model, which was the turning point in industrial structure in history of the world economy. Sir so Arthur Lewis highlighted the increase in population from 1.5 to 2% per annum. There was also an issue of poverty as a result of the reliance on the primary sector, which held the problem of low income elasticity demand. So Arthur Lewis once said, the creation of new industries is an essential part of a program for agricultural improvement. You will surely agree with this statement by the end of the presentation. the need for mechanization of agriculture. Planters saw this as a way to keep wages down, so this primarily relates to the planters paying wages with mechanization, they're not forced to pay wages. Two, standards of living are increased in their life, and also agriculture output. A comparison of one in the Caribbean and England showed that what was unproductive was not land, but labor. He noted that there was no choice between agriculture and industry, but rather a complementary relationship between the two industries. He states that agriculture could provide an avenue for the expansion of the manufacturing sector for more employment. Some developmental principal opportunities that Lewis saw were the development of tourism and emigration. By this, Lewis suggested that Caribbean countries should invite first world countries such as the United States and Europe to develop the tourism industry. The idea of increasing emigration would cut down on the overpopulation. He saw it as an avenue for the individuals to move from to move to Europe and North America. This shows that even in the 1950s, when tourism was a nascent industry in the region, Lewis had the foresight of its potential contribution to the region. In presenting his model, Lewis saw there was certain limitation. One, lack of knowledge of manufacturing. This occurred because the islands were engaged in primary production and there was no secondary industry. Two, lack of knowledge of marketing. Because of the relationship between the countries which purchased the output of primary products from the countries, so there was no need for marketing. Final, low levels of saving. Because the significant share of the population was unemployed, and because of low wages paid in agriculture, savings were very low. 
Sir Arthur notes three components to industrialization. They are markets, resources, which is a key component to fund the manufacturing sector, and economic policy, which is the role the government takes to expand industrialization, such as tax holidays and subsidies. The key ingredients were known, but there are a few constraints relating to the first ingredients, markets. They were the small size of markets and the low income earners. The small size of markets for manufacturers implies that the demand for manufacturing outputs would fall short of its supply. They decided to look outwards at international markets because regional markets were too small. In terms of the low income earners, generally, low income earners spend a higher proportion of their income on food and shelter and only a small proportion on consumer goods. Customs Union. The proposal for custom union was to ensure the harmonization of trade policy so investors will face the same conditions. Inviting. The reason for inviting investors is to bring their knowledge and experience. So after Lewis quoted that, you might have raw materials, but there is a need for deciding where to produce. To address the issue of scattered resources, Sir Arthur Lewis advocated for the creation of a customs union to help in the mobility of resources throughout the Caribbean. The economic policy. But how is this industry attracted? Lewis saw the necessity for wooing and fawning foreign capitalists because foreign capital was highly needed but industrialization was very expensive. To attain this objective, he suggested offering substantial concessions such as temporary monopoly rights, subsidies, tax holidays, and tariff protection. However, Lewis also articulated the need to ensure that foreign capitalists do not conflict with the protection of legitimate interests. Setting up of the Industrial Development Corporation, IDC. There's a need for IDC to promote the region and to persuade foreign investors to the island. Lewis saw the need for a form of regional integration in the form of political federation, which would support other policies, including the IDC and customs union. It is evident that Lewis's work did and still holds significance in all the Caribbean and even international economic systems. His groundbreaking discoveries and work from the 1950s on the benefits of the development of the tourism sector has generated much more investment strategies. Some components of his work applied in the region included, firstly, the use of FDI, foreign direct investment, in developing and improving different industries, including the tourism industry. Secondly, the use of fiscal tools to develop the manufacturing, mining, and tourism sectors. These included tax holidays, ta tariff exemptions, and depreciation allowances. Differences in stages of integration adopted in the region include CARIFORUM, CARICOM, and CSME, and the OECS. Additionally, countries such as Singapore have successfully used the Lewis model to develop their economies. Reflecting on all the research that we have done, it is clear that Sir Arthur Lewis's work has had an impact on the lives of many. His work has led to revolutions beyond your imagination. Our own economy, which is grounded in tourism, is a clear representation of the impact that his work has had on the economy of St. Lucia and the wider Caribbean. It is without a doubt that Sir Arthur Lewis was a pioneer of economics and his work would carry on to future generations. We thank you for the opportunity of presenting on his work.
Thank you. Thank you so much, students, for your presentation. We are always pleased when our young people so eloquently engage with Arthur Lewis's work. I now call on Professor Don Marshall, Director Salises Cavehill Campus, to introduce Dr. Carla Barnett, Secretary General Caracom, our keynote speaker for the 2022 Distinguished Lecture. Dr. Barnett will deliver her lecture immediately after the introduction. But ladies and gentlemen, we want to hear from you. So please post your questions and your comments on Facebook Live and on the chat at uvtv.org. Over to you, Professor Don Marshall. Thank you very much, Professor Audrey Henry Lee. And I also want to extend my congratulations to the students of the Arthur Lewis Community College. Uh, it's the first time I've seen something that done pictorially and um, through a careful explanation. And they did it not only to time, but it was very concise and precise. Thank you very much, students. Uh, my task here is oh, a blessed one. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Carla Natalie Bennett Barnett, and she is she holds CBE, Command of the British Empire. She is the current Secretary General of the Caribbean Community. Uh, she became the eighth Secretary General of the Caribbean Community on 15th of August 2021. Dr. Barnett, an economist, has worked across CARICOM for over 30 years. She was the first woman to be appointed as Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Belize and the first woman and youngest person to be appointed as Deputy Secretary General of CARICOM. She was also Vice President Operations at the Caribbean Development Bank. As a consultant, Dr. Barnett has provided advisory services in public sector financial planning and strategic planning throughout CARICOM. As a politician, Dr. Barnett contested the 2015 Belize general election I was a senator and a minister of state in the Belize government from 2015 to 2020. She is an advocate for gender equality as the right thing to do to create a more stable and equitable society and as good economic policy. She has been an active member of the Caribbean Institute of Women in Leadership, uh, the Belize chapter. She's been a president. She's also president of the Belize Young Women Christian Association and on the board of Haven House a shelter for battered women. I alluded to her Command of the British Empire um, Award. That's one of several awards, uh, but she did receive this particular award for Distinguished Public Service. I now ask you, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, members of the online community and participants throughout to follow Dr. Barnett as she deliver the the, the talk, Sustained Economic Recovery Post-Pandemic, the Lewis Model. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to be here. And thank you very much for that introduction, uh, Professor Marshall. Uh, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, Vice Chancellor, Professor Dale Weber, Pro Vice Chancellor. Professor Rosemary Bellantwine, Pro Vice Chancellor and Professor and Dr. Stacey Richards Kennedy, Pro Vice Chancellor. Other distinguished members of the UWI community, especially Professor Aldry Henry Lee, University Director of Salises and the Salises Directors at Cave Hill and St. Augustine. Members of the Diplomatic Corps, ladies, gentlemen, students online via UETV and CARICOM platforms. Good evening, everyone. I am deeply honored to present the Sir William Arthur Lewis Distinguished Lecture this year under the theme Sustained Economic Recovery Post-Pandemic, the Lewis Model. In our region and across the world, we are preoccupied with building a post-pandemic economic recovery, notwithstanding the persistence of the COVID pandemic. I recall the great pride I felt as an undergraduate in an economic development course at UWI Mona, reading Lewis's seminal contributions at the same time that he was awarded the Nobel Prize. I also recall the many debates about the relevance of his policy prescriptions to the crises of that time. These debates are particularly concerned with his unlimited supplies of labor treaties 
and what it meant to agriculture-based economies trying to move directly to service economies. The debates were, of course, mostly among the professors and the lecturers. As young undergrads, we listened keenly, trying to figure out what the fuss was about, because clearly, Lewis had to have been a great economist to have been so recognized. But more than that, he was a black man and a fellow Caribbean national. While many acknowledged and applauded Lewis for his scholarship, ingenuity, and pioneering research and development economics, he was also severely critiqued for his prescriptions for developing economies as embodied in his seminal models on growth and economic development. The main, the main fight being over the role of foreign capital. The debates between the Lewis model and the plantation model raged along the spine of the then social science building. Lewis saw himself as a simple man who evolved and developed as opportunities arose. He apparently started out wanting to be an engineer, but was prevented from doing so because that opportunity was not there for a black West Indian youth. So he became an economist and rose to ranks most economists cannot even contemplate. We heard of his many accomplishments in the early presentation by the students of the Sir Arthur Lewis School in St. Lucia. And he was that and much, much more. He went on, he, he, he first of all was a first class honors at the London School of Economics. He was a PhD in industrial economics at the age of 25. He went on to join the faculty of LSE and later became professor of economics at Manchester. He was the first black Nobel laureate in economics, the first West Indian principal at the University College of the West Indies, and the first vice chancellor of the University of the West Indies, the first president of the Caribbean Development Bank. Moreover, Lewis was the epitome of a CARICOM national. His parents were Antiguan and moved to St. Lucia where he was born. He lived and worked in Barbados and Jamaica while providing advice to many Caribbean governments of the day. He also advised governments in Africa, notably Nigeria and Ghana. He later became the first black professor at Princeton University. When Lewis returned to the Caribbean in 1959, and subsequently became vice chancellor of UWI, he was as yet in his mid to late forties. I suspect that the preoccupation with the Lewis model is not something that Lewis himself would have favored. He is said to have argued that his intent was not to present, and I quote, a refinement of abstract models, but an indication of how development understood as a multidimensional process of economic, social and institutional change could be tackled in a problem-solving way through instruments of public policy, unquote. While the insights provided by the Lewis model could provide an anchor for a proactive strategy for growth, structural change and resilience building in CARICOM member states, his focus on careful planning, policy making, and effective implementation through well-managed and efficient agencies of government is equally important. Lewis was a different kind of economist. As a development practitioner, he understood that pure economics, that business of differential equations and internally consistent model building, has its place in thinking through how economic systems work. That is the science part of economics being a social science. But he also understood and thought that in making the transition from models to policy making and implementation, the wider considerations of society, the social part of economics being a social science was also critical. Of course, Lewis was also a regionalist who saw the then British West Indies as an integrated whole, as against individual small states separated by the Caribbean Sea and notions of sovereignty. His prescriptions for achieving Caribbean development therefore embodied a vision of what can be achieved together. His vision for Caribbean development was premised on two maxims he held dear and which are instilled in him by his mother, having lost his father at the age of seven. First, anything that they can do, we can do. And second, make the best of what we have. 
These maxims influenced the way Lewis conducted his life and permeated his prescriptions for the economic development of Caribbean states, which he envisioned as having the capacity to become self-sufficient, dynamic, and competitive economies with the support of active government policymaking. He saw the Caribbean economy as part of the international economy, with all that the interconnectedness and the interdependence implied for national and regional policymaking. Norman Gervan memorialized Lewis as a man of his time and the head of his time, both for the breadth, depth, and scholarship in the subjects he investigated, as well as the continued relevance and salience of his prescriptions. Indeed, the 2021 UNCTAD Trade and Development Report acknowledged the relevance of the Lewis model of development for a climate-constrained world and reiterated its efficacy as, and I quote, a heuristic device for the study of economic development through which contemporary patterns of structural transformation and their implications for inclusive growth, wages, profits, employment, and productivity can be examined, unquote. Before going further, I want to look briefly at the current state of CARICOM economies and the development challenges we are now confronting. The COVID pandemic over the past two years has derailed the emergence of CARICOM states from the low growth, high debt cycle that has prevailed for several decades, worsening after the 2008 global financial crisis and intensifying in response to cyclical devastations from the annual Atlantic hurricane season. The economic shock brought on by the pandemic worsened the inherent structural vulnerabilities that we know so well. Limited economic diversification reflected in the narrow economic base, high structural unemployment and dependence on foreign capital and international trade for both consumption and production. The pandemic also amplified the challenges confronting CARICOM states in the pursuit of economic transformation and resilience. The overwhelming susceptibility to natural disasters and climate change impacts, including flooding, coastal erosion, rising sea levels, and deforestation, which result in significant loss and damage. We have had hurricanes cause our country's damage, estimate. When economic activity was curtailed to help prevent the spread of COVID in 2020, with the exception of Guyana, which has, had ex which has been experiencing extremely rapid economic growth fueled by, fueled by investments in oil and gas, CARICOM states experienced significant GDP losses in 2020 and 2021 that were much higher than other regions of the world. Job losses in CARICOM states were also significantly higher than in other parts of the world, and women were hardest hit by the job cuts and bore an even heavier burden of care work at home and in the health system. Job losses were most significant in the tourism sector and related services, as well as in the manufacturing sector, which was considerably impacted by the pandemic-induced supply chain disruptions. Private capital flows to most Caribbean states have also declined considerably since 2019. The economic slowdown also led to a depletion of government revenue even as governments were faced with additional expenditures on health infrastructure, safety supplies, medications, and social safety nets. The public sector financing gap, estimated at around US $5 billion in early 2021, and the external debt are therefore continuing to grow beyond unsustainable levels. By the end of 2020, six CARICOM states had reported a debt to GDP ratio above 100 as compared to one member state in 2019, visibly reversing improvements in debt dynamics that had begun to emerge around 2019. Even as our countries are carefully attempting to restore economic activity, the emergence of new strains of the COVID-19 virus means that CARICOM governments will continue to spend to manage COVID, even as they're moving to address the
Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to wait a little while to see if the Secretary General will join us. I don't know. Remember, if you have any comments or questions, you can put them in the chat. Um, while we wait, I, I could ask Professor Don Marshall to tell us a little more about the Salises Annual Conference that's coming up next week. Professor Marshall? Yes, the conference that we have next next week starts on May 4th, May 3rd, sorry, next week. That will be next week, Tuesday. And we are looking at the theme. Uh, just hold on a second. I just noticed that the, yes, I was hoping that. Right. So we are looking at the theme, the theme, disruptions, resilience, and the way forward. So I should repeat that again. The 23rd Annual Solicitor's Conference uh, focuses on Caribbean lives, and uh, the theme is Caribbean lives, disruptions, resilience, and the way forward. We, on, on Tuesday the 3rd, we will have an opening ceremony and a plenary address being delivered by Professor Justin Robinson. And after that, we go into a series of uh, panels that we are addressing a, a number of themes. One, the first panel, uh, one of the first three panels focuses on COVID and the challenge to education, reconstituting Caribbean economies, the scope for strategic rep repositioning. And this makes the lecture being delivered by Dr. Barnett interesting because of the way in which it, it uh, dovetails with this whole idea of reconstituting Caribbean economies. But as we were hearing, she was laying the ground for an understanding of Arthur Lewis his uh, thoughts, his framework, and, and the sense in which his ideas clash with ideas of the time, contemporary ideas uh, of the time being produced. Uh, another panel for that would be uh, part of the parcel of our uh, conference next week, we'll be looking at crime, violence, and gender. So on day one, then, after we have the opening ceremony and the plenary address by Dr. Justin, Professor Justin Robinson, we then would have three panels uh, that all begin at 1, 1 o'clock and end at 3 p.m. on day one. On day two, we would then have a number of other panels that will see first a roundtable session uh, being delivered on the question of the, just getting my notes here together on the we are sorry to interrupt you dr Ma professor marshall um, sure. i believe our keynote speaker is um, ready for us and we can always um come back and tell us the exciting sessions that are coming on next week so ladies and gentlemen we return to our keynote speaker secretary general dr carla barnett uh thank you thank you very much um professor all the um i got to talk about the depletion of government revenue um and so i will skip a little bit to make up time and simply say that by the end of 2020 six caricom states had reported a debt to gdp ratio above 100 percent as compared with one member state in 2019 visibly reversing improvements in debt dynamics that had begun to emerge around 2019 even as our countries are carefully attempting to restore economic activity, the emergence of new strains of the COVID-19 virus means that CARICOM governments will continue to spend to manage COVID, even as they're moving to address the prevailing development challenges. Recalibration of our growth and development strategy must take into account risks emanating from the global environment. The Russian-Ukrainian war has further amplified the prevailing economic risks and uncertainty confronting small states, including increasing inflation, financial stress, fragmentation of trade, investment, and financial networks, as well as cybersecurity risks. The sharp increase in inflation worldwide, driven by the upswing in commodity prices, particularly oil, wheat, and fertilizers, and the supply chain disruptions, which has triggered higher costs of shipping, as well as dampened the demand for tourism services. The inherent vulnerability to climate risks and natural hazards, as well as the reputational risks due to heightened 
regulatory action on the money laundering, terrorism financing, and global taxation landscapes are also significant challenges confronting CARICOM states. These multiple risks now have to be managed to mitigate their impact on the policy space available to CARICOM states in charting the recovery of their economies. So how do the insights from the Lewis model assist us in better strategizing to overcome the extant development challenges? I submit that we can draw from the Lewis model insights that are relevant to the CARICOM development process and will reference following six specific areas. One, the proactive role of regional integration in building self-sufficiency and resilience. Two, the importance of harnessing technology to modernize the agriculture sector and the scaling up of agri-food production to ensure food security. Three, the critical role of capital, both foreign and domestic, in driving growth-enhancing structural transformation. Four, the importance of increasing domestic savings to finance investment and by extension, the importance of enhanced regional resource mobilization. Five, the state as a direct participant in economic activity and as a facilitator, that is the importance of state capacity. And six, creating a highly skilled labor force to drive productivity. Let us take these in turns and perhaps we can, we can consider how this regional university can help this region to address these issues. First, the proactive role of regional integration. As noted earlier, Lewis was a regionalist. He saw our countries coming together as a single economic unit to overcome the market limitations of small size, to exercise the power of their collective sovereignty on the global stage, and to act as an instrument of good governance. He therefore worked tirelessly to preserve the then West Indies Federation and to establish a customs union, but became convinced that the issue of regional governance was a constraining factor. In this regard, he envisioned, he envisaged visionary leadership, consensus building, and social cohesion as the basic requirements for the transformation towards making CARICOM a lived experience. The community is now on the brink of celebrating 50 years of the regional integration projects. project. It was five years after the West Indian Federation collapsed in 1963 that the Caribbean Free Trade Area CARIFTA came into being in 1968. By 1972, CARIFTA gave way to the Caribbean Community and Common Market, which was established by the Treaty of Chaguaramas in 1973. The revised Treaty of Chaguaramas in 2001 heralded the evolution towards the Caribbean community, including the CARICOM Single Market and Economy, CSME. The CSME was intended to be a single economic space which facilitates access by CARICOM nationals to the collective resources of the region on a non-discriminatory basis and allow CARICOM businesses and persons to take advantage of a larger market size, potential scale economies in production, and other size-related incentives and efficiency possibilities. In so doing, the CSME would therefore enhance competitiveness, stimulate greater productive efficiency, higher levels of domestic and foreign investment, increase employment, and stimulate growth of intra-regional and of extra-regional exports. The fundamental objective is an improved standard of living for the people of CARICOM. The CSME as conceptualized was therefore a platform for building regional self-sufficiency and economic resilience. I rather suspect though, that while Lewis would find favor with the concept, he would be saddened by the progress to date. But he, was also, he would also probably set about studying the problems that keep progress back, and focus on the need for careful planning, policy making, and effective implementation through well managed and efficient agencies of government. In this case, regional governance structures and processes. The single market infrastructure is largely in place. These are the rules and procedures that have been created to allow for movement of categories of persons and goods within the community. The question continues to be. Why does this infrastructure not facilitate such movement? Clearly, there are issues of knowledge of the processes for free movement among peoples of the community, 
the complexity of the bureaucratic processes, and the unequal application of the rules across member states. With regard to the free movement of goods, the use of non-tariff barriers continues to arise from time to time. With few exceptions, there has been a reluctance to use the provisions of the treaty and our court action to ensure that rights and responsibilities are properly exercised. Beyond free movement, the macroeconomic and sectoral policy frameworks aimed at incentivizing private sector investment and trade across the region are still emerging, still to be adopted 20 years after the revised treaty was signed. Accordingly, much of the beneficial impacts that are to flow from the CSME arrangements are yet to be realized. Intra-regional trade in manufactured goods and agri-foods has lagged well be behind the level of trade between CSME members and third countries. And the pattern of trade within the region is significantly skewed towards the more developed countries. Inadequate intra-regional shipping, high cost of freight and other logistics, complicated payment arrangements, and unnecessary bureaucratic measures all serve to frustrate exports, especially from the less developed countries, to the more developed countries in the community. In addition, member states have not taken up much, have not taken much advantage of the market access conditions negotiated with external parties, such as the EU and the UK, as well as countries within this hemisphere. And without structural change and economic diversification, member states will be hard pressed to find products to export. While the CSME is still very much a work in progress, stakeholders have acknowledged that there is a huge information deficit regarding the CSME among the ordinary citizens of the community and a major credibility gap regarding its completion. Last month, heads of government demonstrating a degree of pragmatism that Lewis would undoubtedly favor, agreed to a protocol on enhanced cooperation that will allow member states that are ready to move forward with the implementation of community initiatives to do so, while other countries following when they are able to. This is a major change from the previous practice of no forward movement until all are ready to move forward together. This single change can result in acceleration in several areas, particularly regarding the single market and the macroeconomic policy framework. Agreement on this protocol points to the determination to confront the challenge of implementation by carrying out reforms in the way the community's affairs are conducted. Those reforms are filtering through the CARICOM system, including the political and institutional elements of the community, including closer, more strategic collaboration and coordination between and among the regional institutions and the CARICOM secretariat, as we work together with member states to trim implementation deficit. I would like to think that at this moment, the community's governance framework is moving decidedly towards the basic principles that Lewis established for the transformation of CARICOM states, vision, consensus building, and social cohesion. But the jury is still out. This, the governance structure and function of CARICOM is one area that begs further study and invites research by students and academics at this regional university. Let us look at technology to modernize the agricultural sector. A central approach in the Lewis model is the transformation of agriculture from a subsistence sector by ensuring that farms were large enough to provide adequate living standards for farmers and that through the application of appropriate technology, increased productivity contributed to expanded agri-food production. Agriculture was seen as a major contributor to socioeconomic development, developing in parallel with manufacturing via the emergence of backward and forward linkages. Across our region, we have tended to treat agri-food production as a residual sector, with inadequate public resources being allocated to drive productivity improvements. Our historical tradition of focusing on plantation agriculture for export with, resilient, with residual subsistence food production continued even after plantation, plantation production faded with the removal of preferential access. The policy approach could be described as appearing to have equated food security 
with the ability to import food from third countries. Data show that in 2019, the agriculture, forestry, and fishing sectors accounted for less than 10% of GDP in 10 of the 13 CARICOM states for which data were available. The agriculture sector by itself contributed less than 5% of GDP in six of the 13 CARICOM states. Then the COVID pandemic came, accompanied by the breakdown in global supply chains, coupled with rising food and commodity prices and shipping costs. The threat to food security was absolutely clear. Even before COVID, CARICOM had agreed in 2018 to target a reduction of 25% by 2025 in the US $5 billion food import bill as a way of stimulating economic growth and regional trade. Work began led by a ministerial task force supported by technical specialists from agriculture ministries and the CARICOM secretariat, as well as international and regional institutions, including the UWI, supporting regional agricultural development. The threat to food security brought on by COVID has given even greater impetus to this priority, and the effort is on the way to bring together the public and private sectors to increase investment in, in, in agriculture. Supporting initiatives include the establishment of an agri-food, trade, and information system, along with the accelerated delivery of sanitary and phytosanitary protocols by the Caribbean Animal Health and Food Safety Agency, a comprehensive e-agriculture strategy where digital technologies can be incorporated to promote increased production, improve, secure, improve productivity, market connectivity and efficiency, information sharing and reduce transportation costs is a major initiative under the agri-food expansion strategy. This CARICOM priority is being led by the president of Guyana who, among heads of government, has responsibility for agriculture. A critical aspect of this work will take place next month at the Agri-Food Investment Forum and Expo, which will bring together farmers and agro-processors from across the region, potential regional and international investors, multilateral institutions, private sector organizations, and others, with a view to yielding profitable partnerships for investing in grains, livestock, fruit and vegetables, exotic niche market specialties, and more. The transformation of agriculture and the expansion of agri-food production is a major imperative that is expected to increase the volume of intra-regional trade. But for this to really happen, the challenge of reliable and efficient maritime and air transportation must also be resolved. Studies have shown that resolving the transportation challenge could boost intra-regional trade by at least 200%. And there is also no doubt that affordable travel would allow for greater commingling of our people, thereby strengthening the feeling of belonging to a community. This transportation challenge requires much study. What is the appropriate role of both the private and the public sectors in developing regional transportation infrastructure? To what extent can we and should we see regional transportation as a public good? Why is it that shipment between the Southern Caribbean and the US is easier to arrange than shipment between the Northern Leeward and the Southern Leeward Islands, or so it seems? These are questions that the detailed Lewis planning approach, incorporating planning for implementation, would help us to decipher. And these are questions that could occupy several masters and PhD theses from this regional university. Okay, thank you, Dr. Barnett. Are you? We are on her second recommendation, and I know she has so much more. We have gotten six recommendations. I have three questions for her already, and I have two coming from our online um, audience. So we await um, for those who missed. The first one was the importance of CARICOM integration. The second one was harnessing technological technology to modernize the agricultural sector. And the third one was the accumulation of capital. I would, and, and the fourth was increasing um, domestic policy. Number five, direct state intervention. 
and number six was the establishment of a highly skilled labor force. Of course, there are several issues there. Um, as a sociologist, I, I think about the cultural constraints to all of the implementation of this, um, these policies. And I think about the social inequalities, the Gini coefficient tells us that we have a highly unequal society in the Caribbean. And we have to think about how do we reduce the inequalities. Uh, I, I, as she spoke, I thought about the low passes in, in CXC math and English and how do we develop our our skilled labor force when we can't even get our children to uh, pass CXC math and English. And of course, we have the issue of crime and violence that, of, that retards Caribbean development. And again, another uh, thought as she spoke was the, the role of climate change and how do we reduce the impact of climate change um, on Caribbean development. We have had some comments coming from our Facebook, um, CARICOM Facebook, and one from Mark Taylor in Jamaica who says we need to ramp up our students, our children on digital as a high level educational strategy. Uh, Mark also says, as a proud Jamaican, I am buying everything Dr. Barnett is selling. Incredible. And a question, of course, uh, we have a question from General Roberts is how can policy making be improved to better the CSME? So quite a, a lot for us to, to think about um, as we await the, our keynote speaker. But certainly I don't know if um, Dr. Marshall wanted to continue his listing of the sessions for the second day, but I have all these questions that I have ready for Dr. Barnett when she returns. Prof. Marshall, can you um, can you complete your discussion on the second day as we? Are yes, I will gladly. Uh, although I I know that the audience is much 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 attuned to. Um, the insights being shared with Dr. Barnett and we are, we, well, I have some questions as well. And uh, I'm also seeing some questions from colleagues and, and others as well on my own feed. So uh, in terms of just informing the, the, the audience that we have here before us, before uh, Dr. Barnett rejoins us, reminding you of day two of our conference scheduled for next week, 3rd and 4th of May. And uh, we would have spoken about what happens on day one. On day two, the 4th of May, we begin at uh, 10 o'clock with a, a round table that focuses on Caribbean food security and the Ukraine invasion. So Dr. Barnett was just touching on that and talking about the CARICOM Agri Food Production Plan. And uh, that seems a really interesting uh, entry point for even taking that up next week uh, in our conference. Uh, but here we will have some presenters, Ambassador Richard Bernal, uh, um, Dr. Pat Patricia Nartova, and Marissa Wilson uh, will be on the panel as well. Uh, at the round table, Mrs. Chelsea Bathett boyce a trade researcher, will also be on the panel along with Dr. Listra Fletcher-Paul. She's a former sub-regional coordinator of the Caribbean UN Food and Agriculture Organization, and she's a lecturer in biometrics at the Faculty of Food and Agriculture at RUWAC in Augustine campus. Indeed, the entire panel comprises of specialists and researchers in the area of food security. And um, Richard, of course, will set the tone by uh, situating where we are in relation to the war in Ukraine and this, the extent to which as the World Bank alluded today, it's leading to alarming rates of um, commodity price hikes. The likes have not been seen uh, if it continues like this uh, since the 1970s, uh, with all that that in place in terms of revising growth prospects further downwards and, and the rest of it. And of course, as Dr. Barnett has been usefully pointing out, uh, food security it becomes Caribbean food security is is very much about survival, uh, but it also presents an opportunity to bind the region closer and to solve uh, and to tackle hard constraints like transport and so on that have been 
uh, as it were, delayed, postponed, etc. But there's a way in which the Ukraine invasion and the pandemic has brought to the uh, fore the need for some urgent intervention on the part of heads and the different private sector communities in, in the region to combine and come up with a solution for uh, regional transport yes. shipment. We're going so, to have to interrupt you again, but just keep note of where you, you um, left off. Yeah. But very interesting uh, conference is in the making. So please join us. As I said, if you want to register, please go on the Salises Regional website. And I now invite Dr. Carla Barnett to complete her distinguished lecture. Over to you, Dr. Barnett. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Audrey. We seem to be challenged by uh, connectivity issues, and we'll talk about that in a little while. I want to talk a little bit about the role of capital investment, the critical role it plays in driving growth enhancing structural transformation. Some have argued that the Lewis model advocated what they, not Lewis, described as industrialization and by inv industrialization by invitation, and that this led to an open door approach which encouraged the further exploitation of further colonies, former colonies, by investors from developed countries. Figueroa counters, and I agree, that the catchphrase industrialization by invitation, which many people believe was Lewis's description of his policies, fails to accurately capture the comprehensive nature of Lewis's proposals, the essence of which resided neither in the invitation of foreign capital to invest in the Caribbean, nor with the implementation of industrialization. He argued that Lewis saw collaboration with foreign investors as a means to an end, as a way of kickstarting the capital formation that is critical to stimulating economic growth. The engagement with foreign investors was a mutually beneficial arrangement which could assist in building technical capacity, generate productivity growth, encourage investment in non-traditional sectors, as well as build a domestic entrepreneurial class while allowing foreign investors to earn an acceptable rate of return on invested capital. In the meanwhile, countries would work towards increasing capacity to generate domestic savings as the foundation for building self-sufficiency. Today, CARICOM states are still capital scarce economies that are disadvantaged by their inability to effectively mobilize domestic resources, as well as limited institutional capacity to expand those resources. At the same time, the domestic private sector remains concentrated primarily in commerce and trading ventures. Attraction of foreign investment and external resource mobilization have long been major priorities of CARICOM states and have now become critical to the growth, development, and resilience building process. Along with the renewed emphasis on the revitalization of agri-food production, we may now have the opportunity to test the aspect of the Lewis model which advocates the agricultural and industrial sectors as mutually reinforcing, where neither can go far unless the other is occurring. Perhaps Lewis's vision of agriculture and manufacturing sectors in CARICOM states, expanding side by side, may now be realized. By now you know I'm going to say that these are matters that require systematic independent research and invite renewed study of, among other things, the investment preferences of the regional private sector, the scope for strengthening intersectoral linkages in support of investment in agriculture and agro-processing, whether there are limits to capital market development in the region and what those limits may be. These are matters that bear continuous study and creation of knowledge to inform policy making at the national and regional levels. Dealing with domestic savings, the Lewis model emphasized that they em emphasize the importance of a culture of thrift and the need to increase domestic savings in order to secure the domestic regional capital to fund investments. While the commercial banking sector in the region is relatively well developed, the wider domestic capital markets are less so. Additionally, a bank-centric culture dominates in the community, which leads to higher borrowing costs in circumstances where banks are not positioned to undertake the risks associated with large-scale capital-intensive projects. At the same time, there appears to be significant excess liquidity in the regional banking sector. Therefore, regional resource mobilization has been prioritized as part of raising domestic capital. For some years, 
a regional policy for the development and regulation of the regional securities market has been on the CSME agenda. This policy advocates for the formulation of a common legal and regulatory framework for securities with a view to lowering transaction costs for cross-border investments in the community. Building out the regional financial infrastructure to facilitate the efficient mobilization of regional capital to meet the demand for long-term financing in member states is now a priority for CARICOM. A critical consideration in all of this, of course, is the impact of international financial regulatory requirements. Those frequently updated financial sector oversight practices that lead to costly cycles of updating domestic laws and regulatory practices to meet new requirements unilaterally imposed by various bilateral and multilateral regulators. This reality has not only increased the cost and complexity of traditional financial operations, but it has slowed the impetus towards financial inclusion as the basic requirements for opening and maintaining bank accounts are now moving beyond ordinary persons, particularly small and micro, micro businesses who are now even more blocked out of access to the formal banking system, driving more of them into informal financial arrangements with all the increased risks that are implied from opening themselves to illegal activities to increased risks to personal security. These are matters that have engaged governments and regional financial regulators for the better part of the past two decades to no avail. The protestations against the unfair unilateral impositions by a range of international regulators have been ignored, even as, if it, as it is easy to demonstrate that not all jurisdictions are required to submit to the same requirements and that by far the larger volumes of dirty money is laundered outside of our jurisdictions. In an increasingly interconnected international financial space, it is critical that rules are implemented fairly and equitably so that the undesired consequence of greater marginalization of our financial systems, reduced capital flows to our region, does not continue to manifest. But even as we address that, we have to go back to first principles and consider the critical importance of the lowest emphasis on thrift, domestic savings, and national regional mobilization of those savings to fund investment within our region. All of these, of course, would benefit from ongoing contemplation, research, and independent advice from the thinkers of UWI, some of which is happening and much more of which is needed. The implication of undeveloped national financial markets at the same time that international capital markets are increasingly difficult to access. When access to capital to, is fundamental to the development of the regional private sector, is a riddle that begs solutions. The state as a direct participant in economic activity and as a facilitator, let's talk about that. State capacity is the ability of governments to conceive and successfully implement policy and in the case of CARICOM states, also includes creating the conditions for competitive production and economic diversification. The Lewis model perceives the state as a facilitator of the transformation process, but also emphasizes the importance of good governance and regulation. Indeed, we are reminded by Gervin that Lewis drew the conclusion, and I quote, the long run engine of growth is technological change and that trade cannot substitute for this except in the initial period of laying development foundations, unquote. It is therefore important for states to, take on, to undertake strategic and targeted interventions to raise productivity, especially through incorporation of appropriate technology and to promote human development. The regulatory role of the state is particularly necessary as accelerated investments and developments in blue and green economy initiatives are pursued. Ventures dependent on technology transfers require careful supervision to ensure that they are environmentally friendly and in accord with the long-term sustainable development goals. There must also be a supporting parallel track of knowledge and capacity building through science and technology at national and regional levels to ensure responsible, efficient, evidence-based decision making. However, aside from philosophical considerations on the role that the state should play in economic development, 
The capacity of the state to play a role is constrained by the natural, by the narrow fiscal space arising from the economic context we discussed earlier. This means that CARICOM governments, regional institutions, and all involved in national and regional policymaking, or as Lewis would likely aver, those involved in problem solving. They need to ensure that we use existing resources with the greatest degree of efficiency and thrift in the lowest sense. Efficiency and thrift imply working together effectively to minimize duplication of, energy, of effort, simplify bureaucratic processes that are intended to facilitate the provision of public services but result in limiting such access, and focusing on critical priorities. If ever there was a time we need effective planning and implementation on the basis of clear and accessible data, it is now there is neither time nor money to spare. One area in which our collaboration, coordination, planning and implementation as regional governments and institutions is essential to improving our chances of success is in the advocacy for equity and fairness in accessing financial resources to address economic resilience and the impact of climate change, which we do not cause, but bear the heaviest burden from. We have to approach that challenge in an exercise of that joint sovereignty that we often speak of in hallowed tones. Because the international financial institutions and bilateral partners base access to concessional funding on per capita income, and because the last revision to the income threshold puts it at US 1,045 per capita. All CARICOM member states, except for Haiti, will now be classified as middle or high income status and therefore do not qualify for concessional financing, except where they may be classified as micro states and as such would have access to certain facilities. The development of a multi dimensional vulnerability index to determine access by small states to concessional funding is being done within the region through collaborative work among regional and international institutions on the approach and the composition of its index. But there's much to be done, not only to design a generally accepted index, but also to do what appears to be even more difficult, to convince the major emitters that it is appropriate and just to expect them to underwrite the cost of the impact of their emissions over time. The launch of the Resilience and Sustainability Trust by the International Monetary Fund appears to be a move in the right direction, but several CARICOM states are still excluded from access given the income, income threshold criterion. I am pleased to acknowledge that these issues enjoy a fair degree of collaboration among regional institutions and among member states. There is no room for competition among us on these matters. The scientists of UWI and 5Cs, the sustainability development, the sustainable development specialists at the CARICOM Secretariat, CDB, and the OECS, political leaders at the ministerial councils and the heads of government of CARICOM are increasingly focused on making progress on these issues, which are so crucial to our long-term survival. But I am sure Lewis would encourage even more effective collaboration and coordinated programming of our work to ensure that all hands are on deck as we seek to shepherd these issues to acceptable outcomes in the global arena. And the sixth issue, creation of a highly skilled labor force. Without a doubt, Lewis was firmly in the camp of those who identified the main resource of the Caribbean as its people. The Lewis model therefore established at the development of an educated and highly skilled workforce was key to growing the manufacturing sector, as well as tra transitioning the agricultural sector to high productivity growth. Workers have to learn new skills and become sufficiently productive at new tasks in order to compete with workers in established centers, industrial centers. The CARICOM Human Resource Development 2030 strategy is a long-term regional development policy framework which is primarily concerned with the creation of a globally competitive, seamless HRD system. This strategy provides an overarching framework for upskilling required for the 21st century functioning citizens to address the rising learning poverty rate 
and bridge the digital divide that can become even that became even more apparent with the pandemic. The community prioritized some time ago the development of the CARICOM single ICT space as one of the key inputs to digital transformation, that is, the integration of digital technology into all aspects of social and economic interaction, therefore fundamentally changing how entities, sectors, and governments operate and deliver value. However, the pandemic exposed considerable vulnerabilities in quality, reach and equity of access within communities and across the education and health sectors of our member states. This reality has led to the firm and wide embrace of technology as a necessity, it is no longer an option. A comprehensive strategy to move digital development from where we are to where we need to be requires study, encouragement of innovation through appropriate public policy, scaling up of education delivery systems focusing on both teachers and students planning and implementation of modern digital platforms and improved digital networks and the involvement of the private and public sectors in all of the above lewis would advise no less if technological innovation is the major driver of productivity as in the lewis model the pursuit of the digital transformation across the community now requires a joined up government approach to ensure that it is well resourced and prioritized for delivery given that digital connectivity is now central to recovery and long-term sustainability as i come to the end of this lecture i want to recall my second stint at uwi mona i had gone to the north to do an ma in economics at what i was told at the time was the equivalent of the chicago school in canada I did so because I wanted to understand more comprehensively the basis for the approach to policy making that the IFIs were bringing to our countries. I did gain an understanding that led me to become even more convinced that the social part of the social science and economics needed to be understood and incorporated in economic policy making in the region. So when I heard about the establishment of the consortium graduate school in social sciences and spoke with my friends and colleagues about it i did not think twice but became a student again it's a long time ago we were told at the time that the major aim of the consortium was to foster new kinds of thinking that would lead to new solutions to the problems of development in caribbean society when i got there donald harris jamaican economist from stanford university was the director after he left, Norman Gervin, whom I was fortunate to count among my, member, my mentors, took over and led the way in emphasizing that even as we focus on our specializations, we must never forget that our analysis of the problems of society, whether as economists or sociologists or political scientists, must never allow us to so abstract away from the reality of the whole of society of people as social beings and of socio-cultural norms that must be taken into account when formulating development policy. That experiment that was the consortium amalgamated with the former ICER and became the Serata Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies, which one of my consortium colleagues, the indefatigable Aldry Henry Lee now leads. Others of my consortium colleagues, notably Ian Boxing, are in the university community or in the regional and international institutions. In the Lewis tradition, Salises promotes research and publication across the range of social science, governance, and related issues. That is good. But I would want to suggest that it is time that the institute that bears his name focuses specifically on the intellectual contributions of Lewis. I know that the institute collects and protects his work, this is sometimes difficult given the humility of the man who insisted on understating his own significance. Gervin, who chronicled the scope and volume of Lewis's scholarship, noted that at the time of his Nobel Award, Lewis had, and I quote, acknowledged the publication of 10 books and about 80 or so other pieces. But a collection of his papers published in 1994 by Salises, then Isa, runs into three massive volumes each about three inches thick with a total of 109 items whose wide subject matter bear record to the reach of his mind and his interests thus 
there are 10 papers on ind industrial economics, 12 on world trade, eight on development planning, 12 on dual economies, and five on agricultural economies, uh, on agricultural economics. On the economics of particular regions in the developing world, we find seven on Africa, two on Asia, and five on the Caribbean. Other categories reflect Sarater's engagement with the topical issues of the day or connected to his administrative work. There are six papers on the subject of race and economic development, six on education, and three on politics. 25 items are placed in the category of the development issues, and another eight into a category known as various topics. This lengthy quote illustrates the complexity of the development problem, illustrates that the complexity of the development problem requires a multidimensional solution platform as indicated by the breadth and depth of matters in which Lewis immersed himself. Salises and other institutions in the region do annual lectures in his honor. That is good. A few university professors and lecturers at UWI do research on various aspects of his work. That is also good. Not enough, but good. While international institutions like the World Bank in its 1999-2000 development report and more recently, UNCTAD in the 2021 Trade and Development Report have reflected on the originality, relevance, and salience of Lewis's prescriptions. The Caribbean appears to have ignored the role of these prescriptions in the economic success of certain Asian economies, for example, and more so their applicability to our economic, our Caribbean economies. I therefore, would like to encourage a further study and interrogation specifically of Lewis's ideas within the context of Caribbean societies via the establishment of a chair here at the University of the West Indies to advance the multidimensional approach that Lewis brought to bear on his study of economic growth and development of small states like those comprising the Caribbean community. I do think it is high time Quite deliberately and in keeping with Lewis's vision, the charter of the CDB, where Lewis was the first president, includes a provision to promote regional economic integration. It is my view, therefore, that it would be fit and proper for CDB to memorialize its founding president and our Nobel laureate in economics by financing the Lewis Chair in Caribbean Development Economics at the University of the West Indies where Lewis was the first vice chancellor. And with that exhortation, I rest my case. I wish. Thank you very much, Dr. Barnett. Excellent presentation. And you have given us much food for thought as we tackle developmental challenges in the Caribbean region. I note your charge to the UWI community. I am quite excited by your last recommendation to CDB, and I will certainly follow up with you about that. I think that's an excellent suggestion where we have a chair funded by CDB at the UWI. Well, we have some questions and we have about six, so I'll start. Um, the first one from Janelle Roberts. I'll give you three at a time, Secretary General. Um, how can policy making be improved to better the CSME? That's question one. Question two, given the war in Ukraine and escalating commodity prices, how do you envisage many across CARICOM will cope with sharply increasing inflation in the short term, short term next three months? The major initiatives linked to agro-food production will no doubt assist in the medium to long term. Then the third one I'll give you before I ask you to respond, coming from UE Facebook, UE TV Facebook. How do we ensure that efforts towards economic diversification within CARICOM are successful in the post COVID-19 era? Over to you, Secretary General. Um, thank, thank you very much, um, Director. The first question, how can policy making be more effective. If we looked at the way Lewis approached planning and implementation of policy, what we would see is an approach that was founded on deep, detailed analysis, data collection, and then setting out not only 
the things that needed to be done, but the context, the, the, the requirements for implementation so that you had all of those things set together. Sometimes as governments, sometimes as regional institutions, we identify what needs to be done we claim it as policy, but policy making is only so good as the implementation process that makes the policy come into being. And therefore, for me, ensuring we have the data sets, ensuring we have the skills required to analyze the data sets and come up with the, with the solutions, and ensuring we have the government and regional organizations properly staffed, qualified, and enabled to, to implement the decisions that need to be implemented. So for me, policy making needs to be database. It needs to be informed by relevant data at all times, and therefore the importance of data collection cannot be underestimated. The question about coping with inflation, that's a very difficult one. I can tell you from having been involved in government and advising governments on, on how to treat with social policy, the reality is that most of our economists are coming out of a very difficult process because of the economists having been slowed um, for COVID and, and, and uh, revenues having been depleted. Hard decisions have to be made and hard decisions must include ensuring that the basic needs of citizens of the community are met and sometimes um, and oftentimes we've seen in the past where as a result of uh, a hurricane, for example, um, which is a more short term impact, long term restructuring um, and, and clean up after, there is a, 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 an, a, an approach that requires governments to provide the social safety net. Social safety net provision will require attention by all our governments in this region uh, in the short term. Um, how that is handled at the national level um, is something that each government will have to deal with. The reality, of course, is that we're in a context in which the international financial institutions are already telling our governments, even where they are aware of the difficulty of the, the, the budget process, the difficulty of the budget constraint, given the 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 um, reduction in revenues as a as a as a result of COVID that is not as important it would appear as ensuring that the budget gets balanced in the earliest possible time and we as 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 um, citizens of the community and the governments um, of our countries have to be aware of the choices that they are making in terms of treating with balancing a budget at the expense of of, of making food available at, at, at reasonable prices so that people can basically eat. Many of our countries went through a process in the, in the last two years where they had to make food available. This is a continuing concern. As countries come out of the, the pandemic, it is less of a concern, but the prices that we are facing means that we continue to see in our community the persons who are vulnerable to falling into poverty, falling into poverty at a rate that we haven't seen for some time. So this is a very difficult one. It will require a lot of planning at the national levels, and it will require understanding of a sort that we do not normally expect from the IFIs. Um, I was also asked about efforts towards diversification. Again, um, I return to the Lewis approach. The Lewis approach, meaning you plan, you determine what your best areas for diversification are, and you go into it. The ideas um, that Lewis had for expanding into tourism, for example, were, were not drawn out of, out of the air. They resulted from him going through all of the data available, looking at the resources available that our countries have to work with, and then making the appropriate policy advice along those lines. At this stage, some of the things that we have to make sure we do, we talked about earlier, ensuring that the basic infrastructure for development, which now has to include um, proper, modern, well-functioning, um, digital 
platform, digital infrastructure, as well as digital learning and the, the availability of or the access of our young people to develop their capacities in the digital arena, which means that the schools and the, and the teachers in the schools have also to become more um, qualified and more able to encourage the innovation that our young people need to be able to demonstrate to make it in this in this new world. Okay, thank you very much, Secretary General. Um, we have three more questions here from CARICOM Facebook, from Janique Mayers from Tobago. Are there statistics available on how many CARICOM nationals currently hold a CSME skills certificate and are they actively employed in CARICOM member states besides their home countries? The other question, another question from UETV Facebook. Will women's inclusion in at the leadership level within CARICOM lead to fruitful outcomes in agriculture and market development? Are women's voices being heard? And the last one is a little long, uh, a comment from UETV. I guess they want to, to get your reaction to this comment. It's a little long. As a Jamaican, I am concerned that we do not have a strong sense of closeness to the rest of the Caribbean. And this has had implications for political and trading approaches. I would hope that better shipping and transportation could help. This issue uh, would allow more interaction between our populations. We have great sporting exchanges, but few cultural ones. So I guess the person wants your reaction to the, the manner in which we integrate and how do we become a more cohesive Car Caribbean community. Over to you, Secretary General. Okay, um, the first question was the availability of statistics on skill certificate. Um, that's a, a question that I really don't know the answer to just at this psychological point in time, but it is something that I will, I will look at. I know that we have been developing statistical databases um, on on a variety of things including um agricultural production obviously interregional trade obviously um but some of the issues of collect collecting data um are become complicated because we are dependent on member states sending that data to us um, one of the things that we continue to work on and there's a project that we are in discussion with with cdb in fact um, is on creating um, access to data by ensuring that the, that the data that's available in member states, in the, in the, the secretariat, in our institutions yeah. are linked and accessible um, much more easily. Um, and this would be one of the, the data sets that we would need to know because one of the questions I get asked often, aside from how easy it is to, to access, to, uh, to, to obtain a skill certificate. Um, what then does that skill certificate allow me to do? Does it allow me to move freely from one country to another? Yes, it should. Sometimes the experience is not so smooth. So, but if we had that data, um, and I'm sure we do, it's just whether it's accessible, um, that would make that kind of, of discussion much more meaningful. In terms of women's inclusion, absolutely. Um, in all that we do, um, we, we are seeking to ensure that two, in particular, two groups of, of, of our stakeholders are always um, involved, women and young people. The involvement, the inclusion of, young, of, of women in the first instance arises from the work of our, of our gender, um, uh, sub program here in the secretariat that we're seeking to mainstream. It's not as easy as it sounds um, to do it. The ability to do that depends again in, in great measure on the available of data um, the disaggregated by sex and, and sometimes that not, that's not so easy to collect either. But it, has, it is an important aspect of the work we do, including women 
um, in, in the various approaches to decision making, including women in the projects that we that we seek to implement, that we work with in member states. Um, that's that's a number one priority. And as well, including young people in the work of the community. One of the things that we are absolutely sure of is if we don't bring young people on board, then what we do is make the next generation, the work of the next generation, that much more difficult. And so we want to be sure that our young people are early o'clock involved in the work that we do, um, bringing them on board. The, the, the CARICOM Ambassadors Program is one of the things that we're doing, but, but we are expanding that um, much more broadly. And one of the things we're trying to do in relation to the agri-food um, expo that's coming up is to ensure that young people are involved in agriculture because in the region we have um, an issue um, historically I suppose of seeing agriculture of some as something that we grow away from not something that we seek to develop in and that's that's a that's a transition that that we would want to encourage um, and then the last question uh, um, from the, the person in Jamaica who talked about Jamaica being separate and um, not having a strong sense of closeness and the importance of, of um, transportation and, and all of that. I will tell you that I agree with you 100%. And why do I say so? I am from Belize. We are even further. And in Belize, it is not so easy to keep the CARICOM conversation um going because belize is also a part of central america and so there are relationships there as well but i would tell you that the caribbeanness of belize is what has me here at, at caricom um and the importance of of or the not the importance the, the opportunity presented by digital technology to improve connectivity among ourselves yes we know zoom meetings are not always good we see the line drop here a few times this evening um but it is a way of 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 keeping connectivity it is a way of um having conversations sharing information across the community and one of the things that we've been talking about internally here in the Secretariat, for example, as we go into the 50th year of CARICOM, we saw in the last two years that there was a lot of innovation in terms of sharing of cultural activities online. And we are thinking that perhaps that's an opportunity for us to, to, to be more connected in, this, in, the, in the cultural sphere by encouraging um multi-state um cultural events at which information at which um cultural ideas cultural items performances can be exchanged as a way of helping us to contribute to this community building that we keep talking about um, so we're going to be looking forward to promoting that in in the 50th year of caricom Okay, thank you very much, very much. Our last round of questions. And one question coming from UE TV website. Well, I suppose they wanted to answer whether you consider that the UWI as an associate organization is doing enough to contribute to the implementation of the CSME. I would say as director of Salises that we do quite a lot of uh, policy oriented work, but I will let the Secretary General um, give her assessment of UE's uh, contribution to the implementation of the CSME. Um, another question, uh, this is from UE website also. Oh, it's this. Oh, it says uh, the is it engaged is the UWI engaged in the work of CARICOM as it should. Too often representatives from UE do not seem to know what is happening at CARICOM. And then my question to you is, given the high debt to GDP ratios, should we not insist on debt forgiveness to get our the stranglehold that we have with this high debt to GDP ratio? Should we not insist on debt forgiveness? So these are the last three questions. To you, over to you, Dr. Carla Barnett. 
Okay, you've given me some difficult questions here, and so let me see how I can diplomatically respond. Um, is UWI doing enough regarding the implementation of the CSME? There, let, let, let me put it this way. There is a lot that many institutions, regional institutions can do better, not only UWI, but CARICOM itself, CARICOM Secretariat and others. One of the things that I would want to see all of us do better together is collaborate, coordinate, so that we work together in pursuit of the community's um, agenda. There's a lot of policy advice that needs to be given. There's a lot of information um, that can come out of targeted research. Um, I would like to see more of that um, from UWI, but from others as well, because policy making is only as effective as the quality of the information that goes into making the policy decision. And therefore, to the extent that we can collaborate more, I would want to see as much of that happening as possible. The second question has to do with whether or not UWI is as engaged because sometimes you don't know what's happening at CARICOM. Well, I'll tell you the honest truth is that it's not only UWI who may not know what's happening within CARICOM. It's a range of stakeholders across the community because the absolute correct thing is that, uh, that um, I can only be honest in this, we have not done very well in keeping the community informed about what it is that CARICOM is doing at various points in time. And so that's one of the big things high on the agenda at this time, to improve our communications, to improve the way we relate with the different communities that are stakeholders in the CARICOM um, project, the integration project, as we call it. That includes UWI and other regional institutions. It includes member states, various um, organizations, sectors in member states, young people, women, all persons, we need to be able to reach out better, share the, the work that we're doing, invite input and establish, I would like to see um, a better context for communication and a better output in terms of letting people know what it is we're doing, what the crises we may be facing are, how people can help, inviting input to make sure that we have all hands on deck, as, as I like to say. So this is not something, the, the absence of information has two sides. It has to do with the provision of the information. It has to do with the receiving of the information. And I don't know that we have been as effective as we need to be in the sharing of information and that's something that we are trying to do something about as a matter of top priority urgency as the CARICOM secretariat move for, moves forward and then um, the issue of debt forgiveness um, Audrey you asked me about uh, debt forgiveness debt forgiveness is not something that we do it's something that others do that requires us to have a conversation that requires us to be able to convince those who hold our debt that that debt is supposed to be forgiven. I prefer to think in terms of different approaches to debt management, um, and we are seeing innovative ways of, of, um, of doing um, debt workouts. We are seeing innovative ways of, of incorporating um, other kinds of outcomes in the conversation around the, the management of debt. So, for example, um, there have been um, discussions around um, restructuring debt in order to, to address issues of sustainable development and address issues of the environment. So I would invite you, for example, to look at the, the the um, debt workout that Belize did um, late last year and earlier this year in terms of the, the, the blue bond that, that was issued, which was quite an innovative instrument um, that has lessons for other countries in the region who want to, to use a debt workout to, to, to ensure that funds are available for investment in 
the, the blue economy or in sustainable development of different kinds. So I, I so debt forgiveness is something that we would love, but it's not debt forgiveness is not like going to church and praying for forgiveness. It's real human beings at the other side who don't really want to 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 indulge in that conversation. And therefore I I prefer to to suggest that we take matters in our own hands and we see how we can come up with innovative ways of reorganizing the credit that people have extended to us and making an offer rather than asking for forgiveness okay thank you i had said it was the last round but i just saw a question coming in about tourism so i'm going to entertain because we really want to hear from our online audience. So I wouldn't want to leave the question out. It's coming from UETV, our very last question, Secretary General. What about intra-regional tourism? Um, how many citizens have visited another island nation? So I guess they want your reaction on tourism, intra-regional tourism. There, there is um, there is some amount of intra-regional tourism, and you would find you would find um, data on travel um, on on websites that show how many people leave which territory for which for for other territories. One of the the side developments that we had um, as a result of the pandemic was an encouragement, first of all, of national tourism to encourage citizens to travel within their own territories and then within the community. The extent to which that has been successful, I would not know because the reality is incomes are still constrained. But it would be, I would think, um, an, a, a part of what we would be promoting going forward, not only as a way of, of um, encouraging economic activity, but also to encourage community building because we get to know one another by mo moving from one place to another. I like to tell this story, and if I'm allowed to tell one little story, uh, Audrey, before before we lock down. My, my grandparents are from Jamaica, and in order to reach Belize in the early 1900s, my parents got on a steamship. My grandparents got on a steamship from Jamaica, went to Cuba, lived there for a few years, got on the steamship, went to Cozumel in Mexico, got on a steamship and then came across to Belize. Um, and that is the way we traveled across the region um, in, in, in the years gone by. And many of us um, in this region have family that originate in other places. Um, here in Guyana, where I'm currently living, there is a strong um, heritage persons who would have come from Guyana, from, from Barbados many years ago. We now have, we, we also have persons from other parts of the Caribbean, and we know that there has been a strong outflow from Guyana to other parts of the Caribbean. And now we're going to see, because of the economic activities taking place here in Guyana, a pull towards Guyana again. And so this movement of people through the Caribbean not only for tourism but really to follow economic activity and contribute um, to the labor force is something that has always been there and i would expect that it would grow even more as the community developed as a community thank you very much yes your story in reminds me of my own my parents my grandparents one from martinique and one from saint lucia so we uh that's that's the story of the caribbean people okay, that's, that's the story yeah. of the caribbean people yes. Uh, yes but i must say ladies and gentlemen you will agree with me that we have spent our evening very well i there's so much food for thought i do want to make the note about um, the policy deficit the implementation in policy the university does provide many recommendations and we are sometimes discouraged that our recommendations are not implemented so you know this is one of the the areas that we have to try to fill that gap that we make all we do all these consultancies we do these pieces of research we give wonderful recommendations and we find that they are not um, taken into account and they are not implemented but anyway we just another discussion and probably another forum 
But I just want now to invite um, Dr. Godfrey San Bernard, Acting Director of the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies St. Augustine Campus, to deliver closing remarks. Over to you, Dr. Godfrey San Bernard. Yes, Dr. Sam Bernard. Um, well, I don't think we have anything. Father? Yes, um, Dr. Sam Bernard, can you unmute yourself because we are not hearing you? And otherwise, I'll have to give the closing remarks, but can you unmute yourself, please? Um, are we getting Dr. San Bernard? Hearing you. And I, in the interest of time, maybe I should just move the vote of thanks. There are so many people to thank. Of course, we have to start by thanking our distinguished lecturer, Dr. Carla Barnett. We have to start by, we also have to include our Sir, uh, Sir Hilary Beckles, our host, our Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies. He always hosts the annual Distinguished Lecture. So we want to thank you, Vice Chancellor, for hosting this important lecture. We thank UETV, we thank CARICOM um, for providing their platform so that we can transmit this important Distinguished Lecture. We thank you, the audience, for coming to our, our engagement this evening. It has been very interesting. There are lots of uh, suggestions that Dr. Barnett has made that I will be speaking to her very shortly about. I really take the charge and I accept the charge that she has given us at the university for us to get more involved in the policy process. So uh, the online audience, thank you. There are people at Salises Mona, people at, at St. Augustine, people at Scaville, the other directors on behalf of the directors of Salises, the students and staff of Salises, we thank you for, for joining us. The so Arthur Lewis students, you would have heard them earlier on, and I want to thank the principal, Dr. Keith Nils, the dean, and the students of the Sir Arthur Lewis Com uh, Community College for preparing such a, a wonderful presentation. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming to our distinguished lecture. Thank you, UWE TV, and for your wonderful execution, as usual, of this virtual forum. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Please join us again. We have a Salises conference next week. And as I said, you can find the information on www.salisesregional.com. So we hope to see you next week. Thank you. <laughs>